What is a political centrist and why do some people believe now that is what's needed to save America? Or that their lack of engagement will sink America. We got to talk about this new article that went viral in The Economist. Andrew, it is by Yair Zavain. It says, why political centrists must rediscover their passion. They need to be clear about what opposing populism does and doesn't mean. Andrew, populism is defined as a political approach that strives to appeal to ordinary people who feel their concerns are disregarded by established elite groups. Wow, so this person is saying that the centrists who are known to not be as passionate as the far left or far right need to find their passion in order for America to keep going. Guys, we're going to break it down to the best of our ability. What is a political centrist? Do you identify as one? Um, what does it mean? What does populism mean? What, is, what, is, what does moderate mean? Uh, does it just mean you're in the middle? Anyways, we're going to try to hit all those points. So please hit that like button. Check out other episodes of the Hot Pop Boys as we delve into this. All right. I'm also going to be referencing a brand new book called The Age of Grievance, Andrew, by Frank Bruni. And it connects to what Yair Zavain is saying in The Economist because he is saying that populism, for the longest time, it was defined as like the money elites, right, versus the money non-elites right so in america that would be the right wing would be more the money elites the left would be the non-elites right but they, he's saying also the left recently became the cultural elites so then now the right feels like they're oppressed by that elite establishment so now basically both sides left and right in america in this polarized democracy feel like both sides are oppressing each other Oh, and that has to and this is going to tie all back to centuries uh being a centrist. by the way guys what what you're talking about david is that for example, people always viewed people on the left as being like, hey, you're the oppressor, we're the oppressed, we need blah, blah, blah for this class of people. But now, most recently, it's the right, on the far right, they're like, oh, they're silencing our voices, they won't let us say what the truth is. Right. That's why we have to go on these alternative platforms, for example, and speak our truth because the elite left who runs all the media is not allowing us to say what yes, we want Yes, yes, one side feels oppressed by social Overton window, where I guess more classically, the left still feels oppressed economically by uh, the ultra winners of capitalism. Okay. So anyway, guys, um, let's just get into some few quick thoughts, Andrew, here, just because it's going to get confusing. This, these are written by people with, I don't even know how many degrees everybody has that wrote these books, okay? Um, centrists and middleists and moderates and pragmatists are all different things. Mm, okay, because I feel like a lot of people, when you say centrist... Like if someone was like, hey, I'm more of a centrist, people just think, oh, you don't know where you fall on this scale. Then you're just somewhere right, in the middle. Right. You don't know. You're that just doesn't taking, mean anything. You're taking just this temperature, that temperature, and finding the middle temperature. Right. So basically what uh, Yair Zavain says is he's like, nah, that's just a negative a connotation of a centrist. That's more of a middleist. Okay. A centrist is somebody who is actually trying to shrink the spectrum back to a moderate middle zone. Ah, so a centrist is more on, on, instead of taking the hot and the cold, they're like, yo guys, we don't need these two extremes that are so hot and so cold. We need to just shrink the thermometer so that it's not right. going from uh, neg uh, zero Celsius to a hundred Celsius. We need to keep it between like 15 Celsius and like right, 60 Right, right. And that's what makes, because he's arguing for his definition of centrist centrism saving democracies but he also has a, bitch, a bunch of points and or around the world saying like brazil is now like basically america is not the only democracy with increasing polarization right 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 we understand this guys it's happening a lot in the world even in other european countries i'm not an expert on it but i know that it is because uh there are far right and far left groups in almost every major country. Yes, yes, yes. And it seems like both sides are uh, using emotional narratives to demonize the other side. And when you demonize the other side, who would even like agree with a demon? But maybe that's why the centrist is so important. Uh, Andrew, you found an article that said many Americans are technically centrist in theory. Yeah, so I think for years people have been talking about how there's this majority of America who doesn't feel super strongly left or right. They're actually more issues-based and how they would ideally want is like a mixture of of left and right policies. Right, like you're a saying, bag. I want some policies from here. I want some policies from here, yeah. but I'm forced to pick a wholesale package. But when you're forced to pick between this or this and you don't like it, sometimes you bow out of the race. And that's why centrists have a negative connotation because they don't have their own political party that is powerful enough to even 
hold a candle to the left or right. Right. And we have to talk about how there is an establishment on the left and right. And like you said, there's even factions within a party. For example, Andrew, Bernie Sanders is often referred to as the only last true liberal left because Bernie Sanders, Andrew, is about reforming the American capitalistic economic system. Mm. Like he's not as much about, uh, I guess, tribal narratives or, you know, other things that are more I guess like identity based. Yeah. I guess meanings change and anybody who's in power is going to let the meaning change to, to whatever suits their benefit. Right. Um, even on the right, Andrew, there are more conventional, what they call classical conservatives like George Conway, more Bob Dole, Mitt Romney types that are very anti-Trump, even though they would classify themselves as like conservative think tank leaders for like decades. Sure. There is a range of the left and right for sure. So anyway, let's just go to the Economist article. Andrew, first off, he leads off by quoting this famous Irish poet from 100 years ago, William Butler Yeats, Andrew, where he says, the best all lack conviction, whereas the worst are full of passionate intensity. Basically saying that, uh, you know, like how come the best people always lack conviction, but the worst people would like just are always full of passion. Uh, and, and he wrote this 100 years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, 100 years ago sounds so far away, but that was actually in 1923 or something like that. Uh, I think that I kind of agree. I don't know. You guys watching, what do you guys think about this quote? I would say, honestly, sometimes the most passionate, furious people, they just believe one thing so hard. And like the best case scenario is that that one thing is the right thing, but oftentimes it's just not. Right, because a lot of things in life are a series of trade-offs and nobody wants their squad to be the one that gets the short end of the stick on the trade-offs. He goes on to list how centrism and middleism essentially are different because middleism is one of the biggest, uh, you know, disses on centrism. He goes, centrism is the best, but it's also the most complex because it is a very difficult balancing act because Andrew, and he doesn't say this because, you know, obviously he's so pro-centrist in this article, but it doesn't make either side super happy. It theoretically, Andrew, centrism as it, at its best satisfies two opposing sides, but neither side is like elated or super happy. Mm. And it seems like nowadays, Andrew, people want to be super happy. Yeah. Um, he says, but in human nature, the allure of populism is strong. Basically demonizing the other side, it plays to human emotion. Mm. He says that centrists at their best are supposed to be cautiously optimistic about making the puzzle work even with puzzle pieces that seem like they don't fit together. Uh, so what is he saying? That centrists just want it to work and they upkeep the status quo, which is whoever's in power. They're not trying to like, you know, throw a revolution, but they're also, what, like, I guess, what is that? Well, he doesn't really offer necessarily any, like, high, and this is the funny thing about centrists, man. He's just like, I was, I'm like, where are the details at, right? He basically is just talking about ideologically, they're not naive, they're not searching for utopia, but they believe that the machinery can essentially turn. Mm. Like, the watch work is not going to break down. Because right. he's saying that right now, democracies look like the... If they're watch, you know, a bunch of gears that need to negotiate with each other, it's like all breaking down. He's like, right, right, right. basically, the centrist is going to come and be like, how do we make this work, guys? I'm the engineer. Right, right. And um, he does end the article by saying there's hope. He's saying Poland had a far right leadership. They brought it back to the center. Greece had a far left leadership. They brought it back to the center. So that is his ending in terms of hopes of bringing, like, he did want to provide some examples because he provided Brazil as an example and an American example of things polarizing. Mm, okay. All so right. it goes to show you, I guess different. every country is at a different place in terms of its push-pull arc pendulum swing, right? Um, Andrew, let's just get to the age of grievances. Frank Bruni says that how come everybody feels like they're oppressed by each other in 2024? That's interesting. I think it's interesting because it usually was the far left that was known to be uh, the party of the oppressed. Like, oh, we're oppressed, blah, blah, blah. Like, we're oppressed. No. But now the right feels like they're being oppressed. Like, there ain't no freedom of speech. We can't do what we want. You're infringing on my, on the, uh, on on what the but, old way of life. But would you agree that they're feeling oppressed for different reasons? Yes, yes. Different reasons, different reasons for sure. Um, Somebody, he also says that not all grievances are bad. Some of them were legitimate. Some are exaggerated. Some are disproportionate. Some are invented. He basically said, but somehow all the grievances just got thrown into the same bucket over the years. Right. Nobody's really like, 
I have a grievance. He's like, because he, basically he said every group in life has a grievance, but he says that there, there's no ranking of grievances anymore. And uh, should, did he kind of allude that maybe there should be a ranking of grievances? Yes, he does. He does. Because he says that certain grievances in the past were valid and everybody would rally behind them and address them. But isn't that, I guess, falling under the uh, oppression Olympics? Is that kind of what it would fall into? Yeah. Is you're ranking your grievances? I'm not sure. You know... It's tough to say, right? Because we like, don't have the book not, in front of yeah, us. Not everybody's going to agree or disagree with him, but I do agree that it seems like everybody. I think everybody always had grievances, but everybody's bringing them out for the grievance Olympics. Right. It's almost like, man, everybody had lawn ornaments, but apparently all the neighbors and are in a lawn ornament Christmas competition now mm -hmm. um he also goes on to say andrew even though he is a, like a center left thinker he does go on to criticize the left basically saying you know there is a new cadre or a new squad of anti-racism evangelists that essentially say that we breathe white supremacist air and the only real fix would be reinventing and rebuilding our societies from scratch how is that a sellable workable action plan i'm an american football fan and it's like not just moving the goalposts but literally tearing down the entire society stadium and moving it to another zip code it's just unreachable yes i agree i agree that uh people would think like yo this whole motherboard of this computer is wrong we gotta go get a whole new operating system or rip, rip apart this motherboard yeah right? and we gotta go install this like whole new thing we gotta rip it's like dude this just not that is not happening we're just and it's not worth it and it's just it's going to tear down the country and so many people are going to lose everything and 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 regular middle class people are going to lose everything actually in that cuz we all know rich people will always be fine. So ultimately, yeah, it's not that's not sellable. It's not a sellable solution to say like revolution. Uh he also goes on to find quotes from other people not just his own. He finds one from a journalist Krista Tippett. I don't think we are actually equipped psychologically or mentally to be delivered catastrophic and confusing news and pictures 24 sevens. We are analog creatures in a digital world. And he basically is that quote is designed in his book, the age of grievances to point out that humans are like not meant to get this much information. That's why a lot of democracy quote unquote educated voting populace is still giving into populism right now mm. because it like plays into our, worst impulses as humans right right and i think like even as americans as educated and as smart and as wily as people uh think americans are well, we can, went on a lot of field trips growing up compared yeah, to other i countries. can believe in other countries man where the population is not even as educated or tech savvy if they're given too much information and all this like misinformation and all these uh, deep fakes and stuff like or, or that. Or stuff that's like half true, half false. Yeah, they're going to believe it even more. And it's going to be more confusing out there. So so essentially, that was the summarization, Andrew, of The Economist article, also the book, uh, Age of Grievances. And uh, basically, let's just get into some few quick comments. Somebody said, centrists don't have passion. That's why they're centrists. C centrists, uh, they're bound to moderation and weakness by their very nature. Mm. Is that true? Because Andrew, years of vain would argue, no, no, no. That might be true in general, but centrists are not by nature meant to be weak and moderate. Mm. Can you be a passionate, hardcore centrist? I would like to think so. I think you can be. Uh, this guy says fence sitting is not an admirable quality. I think that here's the thing is, it's not that you're fence sitting. You're just seeing how it all can work. Mm. But yeah, you're right. Some people are fence sitters. Um, this guy said that humans, when they are under duress, they typically look for reassurance and direction so they cra they crave to be led and not managed centrists want to manage people but it requires too much complexity and maybe because capitalism's gone too far or people feel like the western dominance is waning in the world people's motherboards are all in like anxious frantic mode that's mm. why it's so easy for populist leaders right now to rise up mm. on either side because people are in a like a emotional state yeah, it seems like people are being fed this story that it's sink or swim or like you're fight or flight and you're like super in survival mode. So then people are uh, getting very emotional. Um, last one, Andrew, this is a anti-centrist opinion. He said, scratch a centrist and a fascist bleeds. A fascist, because he's saying that if you shrink the Overton window to be more centrist, that is actually fascist towards the people who want to be on the extreme outlier bookends. 
Oh. Because he's saying you become a fascist by limiting the thought of the people who want to be extreme. That's an interesting perspective. But at some point, I don't know, man. You, you get, I don't know. You just can't let, everything can't be acceptable. Right, right. Maybe, right? right? That's what I think. Ultimately, I mean, I just think radically different thinking, radically different thinking is good. I don't know if like centrism or moderatism or whatever is the right word, because maybe you want some issues from over here that are extreme, some issues from over there are extreme. And um, I guess, isn't that what Andrew Yang was kind of sort of positing with the forward party, but then the forward party didn't fully necessarily have its own platform either. Mm. Yeah. I, I, I think about it. Uh, let's just boil this analogy down to food, David. When you go to uh a Panda Express. I like Panda Express. I have no issue with it. It's good food. What do you want to get? You want to get the combo plate. You want the combo plate because you get different things in there to make a complete meal. You can get your string beans with chicken. You can get a little bit of that new spicy orange chicken. You can get your uh, Beijing, Beijing beef that they have. Like You get the combo plate. The combo plate. Oh, you, on your key. carb, you can even get half noodles, half uh, rice, or, or yeah, half Yeah, the greens. super greens and the half noodles if you don't want too many carbohydrates. The combo plate makes the most sense. How come when people eat, they're always like, oh, I want the combination. Oh, I want the combo plate. Oh, I want the sampler plate. I want a little bit of everything. That makes sense to me. Oh, I want, why don't you just eat a whole plate of fried rice then? How come people don't want to do that? Because you're like, it's not no, balanced. No, because I've, I've demonized the other side, so I don't. I just want a bowl. Yeah. With yeah, one entree, and, apparently. And by the same regard, if you go to Panda Express and you only get a big ass plate of just the greens, that's not, doesn't really make sense either. But it's also not going to make sense to just go to Panda Express and only get noodles. You have to get the combo plate. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, I don't know about these words. I'm not a political scientist, so it's like these words like centrism or like mod versus moderate versus blah, blah, blah. I think you just have to have an engineer-like approach because if a democracy in any country, let alone America, is a uh, complex system, as the engineer, you, you should be just trying to make the product uh, successful to go to market, right? right? Like you don't want to create a failure of a product, but here's the problem is that sometimes we feel like, uh, obviously, as a singular person, it doesn't matter. So when you kind of see both sides, you just shut down. Yo, I got a crazy idea. What if there was a third party, not necessarily like a third political party, but some type of third outside party that actually determined and ranked the most important issues? objectively like, you're saying that they you have to decisions. compete on so you're not competing on emotional issues that affect a small group of people you have to compete just on the important issues and but people need but there has to be like this outside party that just determines what the most important issues are and it's the asians the mm. asians should do it that's how this ties back to being asian let the asians decide what the most important oh. issues are no so you're in you're not saying let the don't let the asians run america we don't get to make all the reads for people but we get to rank the mechanism that people make reads off yeah, of and we'll get a, a and we'll get a group of different asians different types of Asians from different backgrounds and different workforce and different well, jobs. Is it, is it because Asians are the least emotional? I don't know. I don't want to dip into stereotypes just yet. This isn't that video. But anyways, guys, let me know uh, down below what you think about all this because I know this was uh, kind of complicated. That's why we had to talk about it for like 20 minutes. But um, can you be a raging moderate or a passionate centrist? Does that exist? I believe it does. I would like to think that... Maybe I am. I think a lot of people are fence sitters, but it's not a foregone conclusion for sure yeah. if you're a centrist. Listen, guys, you got to be pragmatic about stuff, man. Look at Singapore. Look at Bloomberg. I mean, listen, man. Sometimes all this other stuff that everybody's talking about on the news all the time, I'm not saying it's not valid because it's people's feelings and how people feel and narrate things and stories and humans are runoff stories for, you know, we're like the first couple generations to have advanced metrics. Maybe... 
the first generation to have analytics. So listen, guys, let us know what you think in the comment section below. Let us know what you think of this article in The Economist, why political centrists must rediscover their passion. And let us know if you read the summary of The Age of Grievance, what you think about that and how it all ties together. What do you think the future is? Until next time, we the Hop Hop Boys. We out. Peace.